So uh, Pastor Keith and Doreen are, are taking a, a short vacation. So we have the privilege of having uh, Pastor Joe uh, with us this morning. And so he'll be speaking to us. Said I'm Joe Garofalo. Uh, I am. I have the, the uh, privilege of serving as the outreach pastor at uh, Island Christian Church, and in that role, uh, has been able to work with uh, many from this church over the years, uh, with Pastor Pete especially. And uh, so this is kind of like a second home. Um, and I know Harvard View is as uh, as you guys have launched uh, into uh, this community and, and uh, with a new name and just as an independent church you know uh, pete and i kind of kid each other because you know we're always kind of going to be joined with him you know and uh and so uh we may be organizationally separate but organically we're we're still we're still brothers and uh and you know workers in the kingdom together you know so anyway it's great to be here uh, let me just uh, begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll, we'll launch right in. Well, Father, thank you for uh, all you give us, Lord, and just the, the many blessings, Lord, that we could um, we could just enjoy in you, Father. As we um, as we bring the word this morning, God, that it would be penetrating, uh, Lord, that it would be for the good of this uh, church, uh, Lord, and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. I'm wearing an untucked shirt, so I'm just messing with my little uh, uh, yes. Thanks. So how many uh, how many journal? How many journal? Okay. Come on guys. So I, I think so journal I love journal. I have to say I am not always consistent with it, but I'm actually trying to be uh, more consistent. And you know, for me, my journaling consists of you know jotting down certain um, experiences, uh, prayer requests, and actually prayers themselves uh, when I journal. So for me, journaling is a very <clears throat> deep spiritual thing. It really helps me to kind of search my heart. And uh, the more I do it, the more I realize how much I need to do it. Um, in fact, Christian journaling in general is really a place to document the works and the ways of God in your life. And so I, <clears throat> I wanted to read a little excerpt from a journal entry that I made about a year ago. So I'm going to quote it. So this is here's what I said. I said, I am sensing that God has put on my heart to open my mind and ears as to what he would have me be praying for. I'm sensing that I'm not praying rightly these days, that I'm missing some things. So I then started to write some of the things down that I believe God was prompting me to pray for right then and there, and especially using scripture as a catalyst, which I'm going to get into uh, a bit later. And uh, it was just amazing what the Lord was putting on my heart to pray for, things that I never really would have thought of. And uh, so it just kind of told me, you know what, I really need to check with the Lord on how I pray. And I had so many one of these, like, you know, this, this, these times as I'm journaling and I'm really just I'm being quiet and I'm just writing as God would have me write a thing to pray for. And like I said, he was giving me some things that I wouldn't know what he thought of. And like, I was like, ah, you know, ah, you know, so these like aha moments. So it was a really good experience. And so here's, here's a question. Have you ever thought about how you pray and what you pray for? Right? Here's another question. Are you praying for what God wants you to pray? Do you pray expectantly? In other words, with the expectation that God is hearing and acting on your prayers. You know, I'm going to tell you something about praying expectantly. If you're not praying expectantly, meaning if you're not praying with the expectation that God is hearing your prayers, why pray? You know? Now, here's another question. Would you like to be able to pray more effective God-centered prayers? So, I'm probably, I think I'm seeing a few nods, right? That's good. So this morning we're going to be looking at what the Word says, not only about the motive for prayer, but the kind of prayers that we should be praying. 
which is really going to be our main topic this morning. So our main text it comes from the book of Colossians. And just some, some background first. So this is one of the four letters by the Apostle Paul, uh, who wrote these from prison. So they're called the prison epistles, along with Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. And when you read the scriptures in general, especially for study, it's always best to know the writer's original audience, who he was first writing to, and then kind of, you know, what the purpose or the theme of the book was. So this is just a little bit of Bible study one-on-one, -on -one. you know, when you're thinking about, you know, what was the audience, or who was the audience, I should say, and, and what was the writer's theme? If you have that understanding, the, when you do read the scriptures, they, they're just, they come alive so much more as you kind of have that, that set in your mind. And so uh, Colossians was a, a thriving city with a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, uh, meaning pagans, and there was a, a church there that was a kind of a thriving church, but it also had a mixture of these cultures. And so before long, the pagans and the Jews kind of began to uh, introduce a, a heresy into the church. Now, the pagans brought in what was called like mysticism, you know, and, uh, and different different things that would, would be uh, kind of just of unnatural origin, I'll put it that way. And the Jews brought in what's called, considered Jewish legalism, which attempted to diminish the full deity of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in essence, they were saying, uh, you know, yeah, you need Jesus, but you need, you need these other things as well, you know, for your salvation. And so things like the necessity for circumcision for salvation, uh, different ceremonial rituals, you know, the worship of angels, what was, was mentioned in, uh, in Colossians there, and all these other kind of mystical experiences. So Paul wrote this corrective letter to warn the Colossians of this heresy, and also to kind of set the record straight about Jesus, right? And so, if I had to give you the theme of this epistle to the Colossians in a sentence, it would be this. Jesus Christ is supreme over everyone and everything. Nothing else is needed. Jesus Christ is supreme over everyone and Nothing else is needed. So here from Colossians, this is not our main text, but I'm going to share this. This kind of helps set the tone for the entire book. This is Colossians 1, 15 through 17. It's also up on the screen. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, you know, when you read Colossians, just be mindful of the fact that everything the Apostle Paul talks about is kind of bound, it's bound to the truth of the supremacy of Christ. Christ over legal practices, Christ over uh, philosophies, Christ, Christ over festivals, Christ over traditions. Okay, so this whole idea that so the supremacy of Christ is really clearly on display, and I want to give you that little background as we look into our main text this morning. So this wonderful epistle really talks, uh, and it's, as its main theme, is Christ over everything. And so specifically, my message this morning is how Christ's supremacy should motivate and determine our prayers. So I'm going to bring it back down to, to that. Uh, in fact, in Colossians 3.16, I love this, it just simply says, let the word of Christ dwell in richly, meaning Holy Scripture, which means to live in you and to certainly be the basis of how we pray. And let me just say at the outset, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the Bible can be and should be the catalyst for our prayers. It should guide our prayers as we respond to and apply God's words to our hearts and lives. Okay? And so I'll, uh, that's, that's a, a major kind of takeaway from this morning, uh, to use the scriptures 
uh, as you pray. We're kind of going to get into that as we as we go along. So uh, this so with that, this is going to be our, our main text that we're going to be spending the rest of the uh, the message on. It's Colossians four verses two to four. If you turn to it, it's going to also be up on the on the screen here. Colossians four two through four. So the apostle says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison. Verse 4, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So from this text, we're going to see four common challenges that... He addresses here to effective God-centered prayer. And in other words, the things that Paul is trying to remedy in this passage by citing what you should be praying and how you should be praying. So he's not saying in the passage, you know, don't be, uh, you know, don't be not alert or don't be, you know, praying with inconsistency. But he's making the assumption that you know, he wants his people that are reading the scriptures to be praying the right way. So he's citing the proper way to pray. So to pray, to pray as we should, as the message title says. So this first challenge is this. So as he says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Basically, the first challenge to our prayer is lack of dedication. Okay, so are we praying, are we dedicated to prayer? Continue steadfastly in prayer, he says. Pray with the expectation that God is hearing your prayers, as I said earlier. That means pray with regularity, with expectation, and with persistence. Who has seen the movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life? Yes. A book more. It's a great movie. Um, and uh, it's always around Christmas time, right? So I should say, who hasn't seen It's a Wonderful Life, right? But uh, so there's a scene when George Bailey is reaching the end of his rope. Uh, he's, he's not so happy, with George Bailey, right there on the screen. Right? And uh, you know he he can't find the money his uncle lost, right? If you remember that? He you know he ran out of, of his family in anger. You know the government is after him, the cops are after him. You know he's not sure what to do. All right, so he's he's in Martini's bar there. And he's up at the bar, and he's got his hands pressed to his, his hands folded like this. And then he, he utters these words, he utters these words to God. He says, Father in heaven, I'm not praying for you. And I just want to stop right there and say, that's where you went wrong, George. <laughs> you know, I mean, we love George Bailey. He's one of the, you know, one of the heroes of Hollywood, right? George Bailey, what's not the life, you know? But he's saying, he's saying, you know, it's like, God, I try to do things on my own. I don't want to be a bother to you. So he's maybe got the right kind of frame of mind about it. I try to be a good neighbor, which he was. I try to be a good husband and father, you know, which he was. You know, I try to be generous to people, which he was probably to a fault, right? Yet he didn't want to bother God. You know? And so my whole point is this. Well, that might be seen very noble, but it's not how God operates, nor is it how we should operate. You know, if we're saying, you know, I'm, you know, God, help somebody else who has more need than me, that might seem noble, but brothers and sisters, that is not the way we have to pray or not pray, as it were. You see? Because that means that, well, maybe, you know, I'm okay, Lord, you know. But the idea is if we pray from a perspective of brokenness, that we're not okay. And we need the Lord's infusion in our lives. <clears throat> if we pray that way, that's the kind of prayer, and that's how we come home with humbly to the Lord. And that's how we begin to pray with dedication, with persistence, with expectation. Being a praying Christian is the lifeblood of our faith. You know, there's even well-meaning Christians out there who make it an excuse not to pray by saying, "Is you know, if God's all knowing and all wise and all powerful, He knows the end from the beginning. So why do we need to pray?" You know, you hear that too, kind of like a hyper-Calvinism. For those of you who follow that kind of you know theology, there, you know, 
God knows it all, and he knows the end from the beginning. Why pray? Right? He's going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish anyway. Because when we pray, we commune with God. It's not just kind of a grocery, grocery list of things we need, but it's a way of bearing our hearts before the God of the universe. On the other side of the coin, someone asks, well, if prayer, what if prayer doesn't do anything? I've heard that so many times. Nah, it's not really going to do anything. And there's some Christians. But the fact that what if prayer doesn't do anything? I don't believe that. But let's say that's true for a moment. I would say this. That's not even the issue. You know why? Because we're commanded to pray. Regardless of whether prayer does any good, we're commanded to do so. God's word commands us to pray. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians. Pray in the spirit, Ephesians 6. Pray and not faint, Luke 18. Not only that, but he invites us to make our requests known, right? Philippians 4. Jesus himself gives us instruction as to how to pray, right? The Lord's Prayer. And hear this amazing statement from the Apostle James that seems more relevant now than it did when it was first written. He says, you, have, you do not have because you do not what? Yes. Ask. And you, do, and you ask, and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Right? James 4. We don't ask and or we ask amiss. You know, prayer, like everything else in the Christian life, is for the glory of God and for our benefit in that order. In that order. That morning, as I was journaling, when I was questioning, you know, my prayer motives and how I was praying, this question popped into my head. Whose glory am I after in my prayers? God's or mine? It's a good question. It's a good question for us to ask each other and ask the Lord. You know, Jesus said this about himself as he was being questioned by the Pharisees and others as to what authority he had in making the statements about himself that he was making. John 7, he says, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So are you seeking God's glory as you pray? So the first challenge to tackle in being effective in prayer is lack of dedication. The next challenge, lack of focus. Our text says, pray being watchful. Watch and pray. How's that? Watch and pray. In fact, Jesus told his disciples on the night of his arrest, he wanted them not to be kind of in a fog or unaware of what was going on. He's like, don't sleep. Don't, don't, don't be sleeping. Watch and pray. Watching and praying in this instance is being aware of the snares of the world. Jesus said that his disciples were to watch and pray so as not to enter into temptation. There's a good reason to be watching and praying, right? Further, being watchful means we're allowing the Spirit to direct our specific prayers. It means that we pray being honest about ourselves and our shortcomings. As we confess these things, any hindrances to prayer are removed. The psalmist said this so wonderfully in, in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me. That's a good prayer. Talk about praying in the scriptures. That's a good prayer. You know, we get aligned with God as we confess those things as we leave them at the altar of confession. You know, that's how the Spirit works best in us, when we empty ourselves of the things that are encroaching upon our relationship to Him, that are hindering our prayers. You know, there's no, there's no accident that the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, you know, many of you probably are familiar with the scripture, but he said, don't be drunk with wine. I want me to say, don't be drunk with wine. You know, kind of in the middle of this whole this whole narrative. He said, don't be drunk with wine, you know, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So what he's saying in essence is that when you're drunk with wine, you're under its what? Influence, right? Driving under the influence, right? That's DUI. So if you're under its influence, can you be under the influence of the Holy Spirit? No. So he's saying remove that from your life. Remove that. And by the way, you can substitute wine to any substance, of course, but then you can also substitute it for anything that would look to take over or influence your life. Greed, lust, fear, any of those things you can substitute in it. Notice, don't be drunk with fear, because if you're doing that, your heart's kind of in that direction, and you're not going to be open for, the, for my filling. That's what he's saying in essence. So we've got to align with God as with God as we as we ask Him to to just search our hearts and know the ways in me and all those things that are grievous, whether I'm aware of it or not. Help me to just push those to the side. Help me to just leave those at the altar of prayer. And so and get aligned with God's heart. And quite frankly, as we as if, if we lose focus or when we lose focus in our prayers. It's also kind of a reflection about uh, on our Christian condition, you know? Like, are we just kind of slogging th through? Are we just kind of going through the motions in our Christian lives, you know? So, and our prayers really are a reflection of that. So be mindful of that as you're praying. As you're praying. And, and on the other side, you know, kind of the reverse is true. You know, as we pray alertly, you know, it's keeping us focused on the Lord. It's keeping us focused on the Lord, you know? I, uh, about a year ago, as I was journaling, uh, <clears throat> the Lord gave me in that very time that I was, I was kind of seeking God on that, I was writing, he gave me a verse that I kind of used for the year, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and I still, I still love it. Uh, you know, it doesn't kind of expire. And, uh, and the verse is from Isaiah. 26, and it says this, the desire of our soul is for your name. Um, and I, that just kind of popped into my head, you know, as I was going through this whole thing of my, the type of prayers I was praying. The desire for my soul is for your name. You know, when I was lamenting about the things I was or wasn't praying for, you know, when I was, <clears throat> I was either asking wrongly or asking to miss. I, I just believe that God used that to just get me right through the scriptures, and that's my encouragement to you guys as you've been thinking through that a little bit. And in fact, it's easy to slip into kind of a careless condition of our souls when we lose focus on spiritual things and our prayers become kind of selfish. I think we could all say we've prayed selfish prayers before. Right? You know, uh, I've even prayed, this is kind of a sports thing, but I even prayed like a Yankee would win. You know, God knows my heart, but there's believers on the other teams too, you know, so so my prayer changed to like, Lord, would you, and there you go. My, my, prayer, my prayer would be, Lord, would you, would you just give these guys focus? You know, in other words, infuse in them the things that are God honoring and God glorifying, and then let the game happen. You know, so just give them the right stuff. Is kind of what I'm praying for. So, remember, we need to ask ourselves again, whose glory it is we're seeking when we pray. So the third challenge is lack of gratitude. Right? Our text says, being watchful with thanksgiving. Right? Being watchful with thanksgiving. So Paul said, give thanks in all circumstances. Right? First uh, Thessalonians 5. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. So, you know, people ask, maybe you've asked, I know I've probably asked this over the years or whatever. Ah, if I only knew what God, what God wanted from me. I don't even know God's will. What is God's will for me? Well, here's one thing that's pretty clear. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. So this is my will. Okay. You got that one, right? What's the will for what's the will of God in your life? Let me tell you. 
that would cover if you truly gave thanks with a, with a humble heart and a, grand, and a heart of gratitude for all things that would cover a multitude of sins on the planet. In all things, he thanks. Now notice he didn't say for all things, right? But he said in, in, in all things, in all circumstances. <clears throat> We're told to give thanks to God for his grace and mercy in our lives because here's the thing, it prevents us, among other things, from a sense of entitlement. God owes us nothing. It's only by his grace. And, you know, it would be kind of foolish of us to imagine that God was in, was in some way kind of like bound to lavish his mercy on us, whether we're grateful or not. Or not. Think of how you feel when, when uh, you know, when someone doesn't acknowledge something, uh, you know, that you've done, or, you know, like, Somebody doesn't acknowledge, even, even a, at least acknowledge a kind gesture that you've made on that person or that you've bestowed on that person. Kind of like, oh, you know, like, wow. And think about how our Heavenly Father would feel if we don't acknowledge His grace and His mercy and His, His blessing over our lives, right? And just know how much God finds joy in the praises of His people. Praise God. To be grateful for it doesn't cost us anything. Maybe a little bit of ourselves, you know, and that's okay because that's the Christian life, you know. He must increase, we must decrease, you know, as John the Baptist said. But it really doesn't cost us anything to be grateful. Maybe a little pride too, but those are things that we want to go away in. And the fourth is lack of godly vision in terms of. You know, some common um, uh, kind of challenges to our prayer lives. Lack of godly, godly vision. So whose vision fuels your prayers and your actions? Who or what makes the opportunities for your life and your ministry? Are they the Lord's? Or are they your own desires? Right? You know, Paul considered the most influential Christian the world has ever known. And so what's interesting is that, if you remember from our passage, he was not above requesting prayers from the people of God. And you know, I'll just read it again. I love his particular request here in verse three. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. So at Adam Christian Church, uh, right during this Lenten season, which began last, uh, last Wednesday, right? We're doing a 40-day prayer uh, for people to pray that God opens a door, based right on the scripture, that God would open a door for the word, that we would each be able to share our faith and invite them to church on Easter Sunday. So it ends on Easter Sunday with an invitation, invite a friend. <clears throat> and so it's a great effort. Um, it's a, you know, something we're doing, we're taking the Lenten time to do that. You guys right here at Harborview are doing Saturate, right? The door hanger outreach this spring. So in a way, you know, we kind of know how Paul is, is feeling right now because we fight the same battle. You know, 2,000 years later, we're asking God that he would open a door. And shouldn't that be your prayer too? As you're stuffing the, you know, the, the little door hangers and as you're distributing amongst doors here in Port Jack, you know, God, open a door, open a door, open a door, open a door, right? That the desire above everything else that there would be an open door for the word of God, that you would have opportunity to speak. And guess what? You don't have to think, is that a good prayer, Lord? <laughs> you know? No, because the idea is, it, it's here. It's in the scriptures. You don't have to ask that question. If, if, whether or not, man, I'm praying selfishly. No, this is an open door, and you're saying to God, listen, would you use me? Would you give me opportunity as you present these open doors for the word? You know, I, I could say, 
with 110% certainty. And that is a good God honoring prayer. And then you have this fear that, you know, in your own strength, you can't do it, you know? If you remember Moses, when God said, you know, called him from the burning bush, right, in, in Exodus, <clears throat> God said, Moses, speak for me, right? After he said, I am who I am, and all that, he said, speak for me. And Moses was like, I can't. I can't speak. You know, I stutter. What am I going to do? Use someone else. He said that, right? And God says, hey, who made your mouth? Right? In other words, God says, if I made it, I can make it work. That's a good point to write down if you haven't thought of it already. God says, if I made it, meaning God's, I can make it work. Just trust me. Just trust me. How's that as the basis for your prayer lives? And so Paul was saying, look, I can't do it on my own. So the Lord's going to have to provide a door for the word. Now, obviously, when we say door, you know, in the New Testament, door is used in several places. It means opportunity, right? And what a wonderful request that is to make of the Lord. And here's the thing, you know. Remember, Paul made this request while he was in a prison. He said, pray that God may open to us a door for the word. He was in prison when he wrote that. He could have said, well, you know, I can't do much from here. Guys, I'm locked up. You know, I'm going to sit this one out. But quite the opposite. Even though the prison, even through the prison doors, he knew he would he knew that God would make a way. He knew, listen to this, he knew that God wasn't in prison. Right? Nor did he feel God had forsaken him. So I, I'm a, I love history, and I, I read quite a bit of it, and there was this, there was this French general by the name of Marshal Folk, and just before the, the first battle of Marne, okay, this, this general reported he said this, he says, my center is giving. Meanwhile, my center is breaking. <clears throat> my left wing is retreating. The situation is excellent. I'm attacking. No, he wasn't insane. He knew that God could turn defeat into victory at the very moment when the enemy thought themselves triumphant. Yeah. And it's no doubt Listen to this, that the devil had thought he gained a great advantage when he shut Paul up in prison. Or so he thought. But from that particular prison cell came the four prison epistles, which have been an untold blessing to millions and millions of people throughout the centuries. And from that very cell, the gospel went out. First the prison guards, and through them, many more in Caesar's palace, who may have otherwise never been reached. So you know, God would take something that would be thought of as an evil thing and he would use it for good. Right? You see that throughout, the, throughout the scriptures. You see that in modern history too, in hindsight. It's like, oh, that's why that happened. That's why that had to happen that way. God used Paul's chains, chains as a mean, as a means to accomplish his ministry. In fact, one of the other prison epistles in, in the book of Philippians, Paul wrote this during the same period. He makes this statement. He said, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's writing this in prison as well, the same period of, of imprisonment. He wrote Philippians as well. So that it has become known throughout the, world, the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that, I, that my imprisonment that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And I'd say God answered his prayers far above all he could ask or imagine. 
He surely opened a door for the word all the while as Paul was shackled to a prison guard. Now, the last time I looked, none of us are chained or shackled to a prison guard, are we? But what are you shackled to? What's preventing you from praying as you should, including praying for open doors? Are you your work? Are you shackled to that? Are you shackled to your own needs? Are you shackled to a hobby? Are you shackled to fear? Fear of a lot of things. But I hope you can begin to see what God can do through those who pray for open doors to share their faith and, and their very lives. Who pray bold prayers and who pray for boldness. Right? Two different things. Praying bold prayers but yet also praying for boldness. And in another portion of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is also asking and, and asking as a prayer request that they would pray for boldness for him. And this is the Apostle Paul. We pray for the things that God wants us to pray through the scriptures. Right? God can do so much to those who pray with devotion, to those who pray with alertness, to those who pray with thanksgiving, to those who pray with godly vision. And so with all that, at Harvard New Christian Church, let's pray. Well, Father, I, I thank you for all you give us, certainly, and for the, for the opportunity even presenting itself right now for this church to participate in the Saturate program. I encourage you to uh, help them take this next step. Praying, of course, for open doors for the word as God, as God makes a way, Lord. Father, you would do that in the hearts and minds of each person here. And Father, thank you for your word to us and the example you set for praying as we should. Father, help each person here just grasp that. Know that they don't have to be eloquent in their speech. But as you made us, you also make it work. And you make us work in our way. Father, assure each of us here that all your promises in Christ are us. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.